Gather ye round, noble friends, for today's episode is the last regular Jimquisition of the year! Next week we're going to be doing the Jimquisition Awards, naming our top five games of the year, which you're all going to agree with, and following that we will have the top ten shittiest games of the year, as we do every year, for your Sheldonfristic delight. Sheldonfristic? That's not right. Barring any unforeseen emergency Jimquisitions, after all, Konami's still got a couple weeks left in the year to fuck something up, uh, this will be the last regular episode, and then we're gonna do our year-end stuff. So, that's all good, but that's enough of that bollocks. Let's talk about Final Fantasy Final Fantasy XV came to the world after a long, long wait, and unlike The Last Guardian, the wait was actually worth it. The game that was at one point known as Final Fantasy XIII Versus broke free of the shackles of that horrible package of titles and gave us a beautiful boy adventure, an endearing, highly entertaining game that, on a personal level, has reignited a fondness for Final Fantasy that I've not felt since the PlayStation 2 era. As great as the game is, it does have flaws, some of which I can easily name off the top of my head. The last half feels considerably more rushed than the first, you need to watch an entirely separate movie, Kingsglaive, in order to understand key plot points and characters, and the constant watching of these beautiful boys and their beautiful boy car can get pretty old, even with the ability to listen to music from Final Fantasy IX, aka the best Final Fantasy. There are lots of other flaws, none of them huge deal breakers considering the overall enjoyment factor of the game, but they definitely hold stuff back. Square Enix is aware of these problems, and it's promising extensive updates in both the short and long term to address at least some of them. Usually when a company promises post-launch fixes it's nothing to get worked up about because very few publishers are going to spend enough money and time to efficiently upgrade a product they've already successfully sold. But Square Enix has quite clearly mapped out its plans and they are, if I may be so bold, extensive to what might be an unprecedented level. The first big update is an overhaul to Chapter 13, deemed by some the worst bit of gameplay in all of Final Fantasy Dirt. I'd have to disagree, I can't personally say I found it all that irritating. And there have definitely been way worse segments in better Final Fantasies. Hell, I'd take Chapter 13 over that boring as fuck Ramu Riddle section in 9. At any rate, Squenix will be boosting the effectiveness of that one weapon you get in Chapter 13 and making other unspecified improvements. More interestingly, and perhaps controversially, the company has promised to go back and start adding more story elements to the main narrative. If you've finished 15, you'll know that things start properly going off the rails in the latter half, with character motivations changing without any development and some characters built up as key to the plot essentially being put on a bus and forgotten about. So far, Square Enix has only name-checked the biggest disappointment of a character, Ravus, who absolutely needed so much more screen time than he got, but he won't be the only one to get some depth and motivation. These new additions will be fully voiced and localised, which is no small undertaking and could dramatically enhance the story if they're done well. Long term, Square Enix is looking toward potentially adding more playable characters beyond the four beautiful boys, customizable avatars, new game plus stuff, and more standard additions like alternate game modes, boss fights, UI tweaks, and extra side missions. It's a huge game plan, and for a single player big budget title, one of the most in-depth layouts I've seen. Unless they're multiplayer games, most publishers give up on fixing a game's shit within the first week or two. Hell, the dick skins at Warner Brothers would rather work on an Arkham Games DLC than actually fix the Arkham game to which the DLC is attached. What Square Enix promises is unusual for a major publisher, and it's a roadmap that's both exciting and a little concerning. First of all, I think Square Enix's commitment to ensuring a consistent quality in Final Fantasy XV is admirable, and this comes from a guy who's so critical of the publisher that the Japanese side of it wants nothing to do with him. I'm impressed that this publisher, one of the more money-hungry ones out there, has a list of significant, expensive additional content that it'll be rolling out at no extra cost to the audience. That the developer slash publisher is both aware of the game's narrative faults and desirous of tangible positive improvement is not something I'd expect to see from Square Enix, or indeed many companies out there. Usually when games have fixes so dramatic, they'll opt for entire re-releases, like when the disappointing Slain was reworked and released once more as the surprisingly enjoyable Slain Back From Hell. Some of these games might offer the improved version free to previous buyers, but they're looking to bank off the relaunch spotlight all the same. The work Square Enix is talking about will take them long beyond the most profitable period of the game's lifespan, and I'm struggling to find a sufficient cynical reason for it. I'm inclined to believe, at least on some major level, that Squenix is motivated primarily by artistic integrity. 
<laughs> Can't wait to try it. The best financial reason I have is that Final Fantasy XV has a season pass with upcoming paid DLC, so free updates could be a good way to keep potential buyers of said DLC invested in the beautiful boy experience. Obviously corporations don't spend resources on stuff if they can't get something back out of it, but even so, it would appear that Squebits is genuinely concerned about telling the best story it can. And I'm definitely happy about that, because I enjoyed the story well enough, but would love to see glaring holes covered and forgotten characters fleshed out. If 15 can adequately explain what the fuck is up with Ravers, give us more story for the Niflheim Empire outside of the fact they're LARPers with machine guns, and better structure the latter chapters, I'll be seriously thrilled. All that said, I've often been critical of what I call patch culture, where games are rushed out to market and fixed after the fact. It's become normalised to the point where we expect expect big day one patches that take tremendous amounts of time with any new video game we buy. Hell, even Final Fantasy XV, which was delayed to avoid massive day one patches, released with a massive day one patch. Significant story content changes offer a potential new precedent, and certainly raise a new bar in patch culture, where not just hastily written code, but hastily written scripts can be returned to and altered after the game's already hit shelves. For titles like Final Fantasy, where the story is one of the big its draws, it's as crucial a thing to nail the plot as it is for an FPS to have guns that work properly. We already have a problem in AAA games with getting the product out first and worrying about fixing it later. So far that attitude has mostly been relegated to bugs and other technical details. Extending it to actual character development and significant plot detail is actually sort of fucked up when you think about it, and most definitely not something that should become too commonplace. I don't often like to compare video games to other media, but when talking about narrative-driven RPGs, I think it's more salient to do so. In that regard, imagine if Breaking Bad had a rushed ending where, I don't know, Dexter Morgan is suddenly all fuck meth and quits his job as president to go live consequence-free in Essos for the rest of his days. Really unsatisfying, nobody getting their comeuppance, and they don't even resolve that big plot thread with his exploits in Westworld. But then a few months later it's on Netflix with a totally different ending that gives you everything you want. Or if books issued little pamphlets pamphlets weeks after publishing with new pages in them. If that sort of thing became normalised or acceptable, that'd be weird, right? I'm not talking about director's cuts or anything like that, I'm talking about works of entertainment that are just constantly fiddled with and updated and changed after they've already been sold to you. It'd create a weird, near, untrusting relationship between the audience and the art. There's something to be said for wanting to go back and improve the stuff you've made, and that can be admirable, that can be positive, but do it too much much and shit starts to hit the fan. Right George Lucas? Wouldn't it be weird if you were able to keep updating your movies and nobody was ever telling you to stop and you just kept changing it and changing it until it was full of bizarre shit that nobody asked for and you keep adding to it and adding to it so it's a visual mess full of non sequitur scenes and altered audio that confuses more than it enhances? Wouldn't that be fucked up, George Lucas? Do you think maybe it shouldn't be encouraged too much because it allows you to grow creatively complacent for various but equally destructive reasons, George Lucas? Do you think it runs the risk of you spoiling the broth by being too many cooks even though there's only one of you, George Lucas? George? Lucas? George? George? As with many things in the big budget game industry, this idea of a patchwork narrative is interesting and potentially positive right now, and will remain acceptable in specific situations until big publishers catch wind of it en masse and just start taking the piss. And that's always the problem, because if this idea succeeds and catches on, I can only imagine certain companies will be as happy as they were the day they discovered they could sell Japanese voiceover tracks as DLC and people would actually pay for it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I never underestimate the ability of this industry to take a promising idea that's best used sparingly and run it into the ground, because the industry is so stuffed full of tremendous cum. <laughs> We already deal with what I dubbed early triple access games, games like Star Wars Battlefront and Street Fighter V that come up lacking in content and blatantly unfinished with an eye toward patching in crucial features at later dates. It took Battlefront a fucking year to become a finished video game, so Square Enix's move, while it seems to genuinely come from a good place, I will give them the benefit of the doubt, could only inspire the industry to take the piss more than it already does. This is before we even talk about archiving. I consider the archival of games and their 
their various states to be an important thing. I think it's important to know what Final Fantasy XV was before it was patched, but you patch it out enough times in enough copies, that original version of Final Fantasy XV, something that's genuinely culturally interesting, could just be lost. Video game publishers don't respect the preservation of games and the archival of the original states of games. They're happy to just discard and throw them away, which I just think long term isn't very good for the medium. Right now, preservation's a little easier because games are still coming out on physical discs, but as the industry wants to more and more phase physical media out, the harder it's going to be to archive some of this stuff. Final Fantasy XV gets away with it for now because it is by and large, a very well put together game that's already engrossing and satisfying enough to play. It's when games don't even try to be good in the first place and worry about fixing it all post-sale that this could be a problem. And that's something I really wouldn't put past the charlatans pushing their wares out there. In fact, half the companies won't even give us beautiful boys as a trade-off. And that's a deal I don't want to take. That's it. What's what? I've come up with a new ninja block. Regardless of any game discussion, controversies, whatever, I am absolutely thrilled that I finally have a, a Final Fantasy game that I'm excited about again. You know, I beat it last week, but I'm still thinking about it, still really into it, and I haven't felt that way, like I said earlier, since the PS2 era. Uh, for me, the, the, the past whole generation and change uh, has been just a sad time as someone who loved the Final Fantasy series. A lot of people think because the only main review I ever did of a Final Fantasy game was 13, a lot of people assumed that I hated Final Fantasy, and indeed Japanese role-playing games in general. Uh, but I've always had a, a, a love for Final Fantasy, it's just that love was crushed steadily by Squenix uh, over the past couple of years. And some of that's come back with 15, because despite its many, many problems, it is a beautiful boy adventure, and this beautiful boy is all about it. Until next week, where we will be doing the Jimquisition Awards, I remind you all to thank God for that's it! I've come up with a new recipe! Sorry, I just saw some mushrooms on the floor. <laughs>